From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Democracy is, uh, I think most people can agree, a fragile concept for most of us listening in the audience today. The events of January 6th in Washington, D.C. show just how fragile this system can be. And across the world, you can sadly find numerous examples of coups and dictators and so on. And democracy, in a way, is like a living organism. It must be nurtured. It must be protected. In today's episode, we're exploring another story of democracy in peril and often overlooked example. It's the story of an alleged conspiracy. It's a story of big business. It's the story, perhaps um, most singularly, about a man named Smedley Butler, a complex guy who, in his time, was called everything from a war hero to an activist and a traitor and a crackpot. This is the story of the business plot, and we are not exploring it alone. We are immensely fortunate to be joined today with Jonathan Katz, a multi-award winning journalist and most recently the author of Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, The Marines, and the Making and Breaking of America's Empire. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, good to to be here. I got to tell you, Jonathan, we we talked about this story, just Smedley Butler, in 2010 in a video we made for YouTube and you know we delved into it I I recall Ben you and I just being kind of I mean I was personally flabbergasted to know that this was something that had occurred I didn't think something like this was possible Uh, I wonder if guys should we start with Smedley Butler the person or should we start with the business plot in general let's maybe go into it this way um Jonathan, you and I have talked in the past for some other projects as you were as you were working on this book, which is, for my money, the most comprehensive work on Smedley Butler. Uh, you came to this as a seasoned investigative journalist, and I think, in a way, um, this story starts for you in Haiti, right? When you were you were on the ground in Haiti during the deadliest earthquake ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere to this point. So could you tell us about how that connected you to Smedley Butler? Yeah, so, you know, the people who know about Smedley Butler usually know about him through one of two routes. Either either they were Marines and learned about him in boot camp, um, or they know about him because of either the business plot or uh, his sort of anti-war, anti-imperialist activism in the 1930s, especially his, his book, War is a Racket. Um, I am part of a minority of a minority of people who know about him principally because of his work overseas, especially, as you note, in Haiti. So I was the Associated Press correspondent uh, in Haiti from 2007 until 2011, uh, which means that I was there on uh, almost exactly, actually, 12 years ago on on January uh, 12th, 2010, uh, when, when I was very fortunate to survive uh, the 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 7.0 earthquake that that killed you know 100,000 to 316,000 people and it was when so i i had encountered smedley's name before that um in the context of an event that most americans don't know about but haitians very much do which was the us occupation of haiti um that lasted for 19 years from uh, 1915 to 1934 it was the longest continuous U.S. occupation, uh, military occupation, until that record was broken in Afghanistan just before uh, we withdrew. And after the earthquake, I, you know, I sat down to write my first book um, about the earthquake, and I was looking for information about, you know, 
I was trying to basically set the scene of like, how did Haiti become so fragile? How did how did this country become so poor? And and how did things get to a place where, you know, a, a relatively moderate earthquake, it was big, I can tell you, but it was a relatively moderate earthquake as earthquakes go, killed more people than any other earthquake ever recorded in, in North or South America. And that brought me back to the Haitian, the U.S. occupation of Haiti, which brought me to Smedley Butler. And so I was looking for information on Butler, um, you know, to sort of liven up this in case I was going to use any of his information in the book, because he's a fascinating, like, I could just tell that he was like a colorful guy. He's a Quaker from, uh, you know, Philadelphia. So the, so the first thing that stuck out to me was um, some of his letters have been collected in, in an edited volume. Um, and he uses his Quaker these and, and thys. So he's like, you know, He's like writing his parents and he's like, you know, like thy, thy affectionate son is, is in Haiti doing horrible things. And so then I was like, OK, so who, you know, what did this guy look like? Like, is you know, just plug him into Google, see like if there's more information out there. And what comes up is the business plot and war is a racket. And my first instinct was like, well, this can't be the same guy because in Haiti, Butler was known as the devil. Literally, they called him that. Like he was, you know, considered, you know, one of the worst of the worst of the Marines who who were the aggressors in in that uh, occupation, at least as far as the Haitians were concerned. And then, you know, to have that guy turn around and become a anti-war activist, uh, somebody who like, you know, foils a fascist plot, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But of course, it was the same guy. And that set, set me off on, on the path to try to figure out, you know, who... Who was Smedley Butler? Wow. My understanding of the part of the Marines uh, deployment, the use when they were in Haiti was to protect property and interest, like American interests. Could you just talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah. So uh, without getting too into the weeds here, but the, um, uh, the, the, occupation started with an invasion in 1915. It actually started first in, December of 1914 with a bank heist, the Marines, uh, Butler was not one of these Marines, although he, he would have been if he had been ordered there. Um, uh, some Marines came ashore and literally robbed the Central Bank of Haiti. They took half the gold and brought it to New York, to a, to a, a vault on Wall Street, where as far as we could tell, it, it never it never left. It certainly never went back to Haiti. Um, the, the reason for that was... Um, and re reason, I'm, I'm kind of putting reason in air quotes here, but the the, the reason for that was uh, that Haiti, so Haiti uh, traces its origins to uh, the only successful slave revolution uh, in modern history. Uh, the, the enslaved people of uh, the French colony of Saint-Domingue rose up, overthrew slavery and their French imperial masters. And as a reward for this, about 20 years later, the French then imposed a crippling indemnity on Haiti, where they basically said, okay, we won't invade you again, and we won't, uh, and we'll give you diplomatic recognition if you pay us an enormous fine, which it took the rest of the 19th century for, for Haiti to do. And ha the Haitians did that. But in order to do that, in part, they had to take out loans from banks elsewhere. And one, some of those banks were in the United States. And the biggest of those banks in the United States was the National City Bank of New York, nowadays known just as Citibank. And Citibank was worried that they weren't going to get, uh, you know, the full payment of their debt. And so they went to the Wilson administration, Woodrow Wilson was president at the time, and said, let's rob the bank. That made things even worse in Haiti. A president was assassinated. The last time a president of Haiti was assassinated until last summer in 2021. And then that was used as the pretext for a full invasion. So it was an invasion basically requested by Citibank and done for, you know, for the purposes of, of making sure that their ledgers were, were right. Um, and then other American capitalists, other, you know, uh, exporters, uh, investors, uh, you know, real estate people, like all the, you know, all these other Americans came down to, to take advantage of that. And Smedley Butler was, he was ultimately the, the, the point man on the ground. He, what makes him a fascinating character and, 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 and one of the reasons why, you know, I, I just, 
you know, spent the last, well, seven years really writing a book about him, um, is because he was everywhere. Uh, he was he was in every you know U.S. invasion and occupation, basically from uh, uh, the war in Cuba against Spain in, in 1898 until you know the 1930s, the eve of of the Second World War. Um, but Haiti, uh, for w- one of the things that I had in common with Smedley Butler, um, is that both of us spent <laughs> a um, you know a significant amount of time and and you know to a certain extent uh, you know the height of of at least you know a, a part of our careers uh, for better. For worse, in both of our cases, in in an amazing country, but but in Haiti, and the reason I think this is a great entry point is because this is your, like you said, you're in a minority of minorities by the way you connected with the story of Spentley Butler, but uh, this story is also still so extraordinarily obscure to the average member of the American public. Uh, They, like you said, Marines may learn of Butler in boot camp uh, where he is considered, he is considered a war hero because he was deployed on a global scale. But we, when we're talking about this story, this will interest our audience today. So we started with a bank heist. Citibank conspired with Uncle Sam to rob a bank in Haiti. That's not the conspiracy. That's not what this episode is about. That's, that's totally, just how we totally separate. Yes, yeah, it's like yeah. a side that, conspiracy. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> that's a side conspiracy. Yes, uh, the conspiracy that we're talking about that we're going to explore in depth today is something that today is known as the business plot. And I love that you've already pointed out uh, Butler over the course of his life had this transformation from a diehard. Marine, a a true believer, as maybe uh, Stan Lee would have put it. And he became uh, a very, a very prominent, very outspoken, barnstorming activist. Could you, I know this is tough because you just, you wrote an entire book on this, but could you in a, in a, like a brief kind of headline snippet, could you tell everyone what the business plot was, at least from Smedley's perspective? Yes. So, Essentially, the headline of the business plot is that uh, bankers, specifically, well, uh, brokers, specifically one one uh, uh, prominent Wall Street stock brokerage, um, approached Butler with a plan in which Butler would lead a army of about half a million World War One veterans. Into Washington, they would basically go up Pennsylvania Avenue, you know, maybe surround the White House and intimidate Franklin Delano Roosevelt into either resigning or handing the bulk of his power over to a cabinet secretary who the plotters would name. And the reason eerily, uh, eerie rings of the present. Very much so. What we saw. Very much so. The insurgency. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, just the other way up, the other way down Pennsylvania Avenue, basically. Um, the numbers go up instead. Uh, and um, the reason that they were doing that uh, was because they were rich and they hated the New Deal. So it's the Great Depression, millions of Americans are suffering, and Franklin Roosevelt has promise and is starting to implement programs to use the wealth of the federal government, the power of the federal government to help Americans in lots of different ways by, you know, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, giving them Social Security, you know, uh, uh, old age insurance, uh, you know, helping with infrastructure, the Tennessee Valley Authority, so like the the electrification of the rural South, you know, deposit insurance, jobs through the the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, Not all those things were were in place at this moment, but but this is what he was rolling out. So commies, commies, commie stuff, basically. Exactly. (laughs) And from, from the perspective of you know, the people who Butler alleged were, and really what Butler's contact with this, with this stock brokerage alleged were behind this plot, um, they considered it one of the DuPont brothers of DuPont, um, uh, who, who was, you know, sort of the most powerful uh, and, and richest person associated allegedly with this plot. Um, he did say 
and and you know this is this is recorded um, that the New Deal was you know essentially the socialist doctrine by by another name. I mean the thing is that in 1933 1934 1934 is when when Butler blows the whistle on this in front of a, a, a House committee in in Congress. Um, you know a lot of people thought that liberal democracy was over. The Great Depression was a tremendous shock uh, to the capitalist worldview. Um, it was it was a total failure of capitalism. And it looked to a lot of people like, you know, having people sort of, you know, have um, the, the American style constitutional government elect their leaders, elect a president like Franklin Roosevelt, that that, that, that was maybe on its last gasp. And that the only ways forward would be either fascism or communism. In, in, in the sense that Stalin was was uh, was was implementing communism in, in the Soviet Union at that time. Why did these plotters think that he would be down for this, given his track record as like a patriot? Right. You know, whoever we know was behind it. And I can I can talk about the people that we know and, and the people who, who we can theorize. They very badly miscalculated, obviously, in yeah. in, in in getting Butler. Um, but it was it, you could see what they were thinking. So. As, a, as we noted at the, at the top here, Butler had a long track record of participating in coups and overthrowing democratic governments all over the world. Um, he had he had helped uh, overthrow governments in Nicaragua. He had helped overthrow governments in Honduras. Um, he had helped uh, you know prevent a democratic government from from uh, coming to power in the Philippines when he was you know participating in the colonization of the Philippines. In Haiti. Um, where he also helped overthrow uh, uh, the president through the invasion of 1915. In 1917, he actually led a kind of a, a business plot, January 6th-like thing in Haiti, in Haiti's National Assembly, in the parliament. Essentially, Haiti's constitution, going back to you know their, their, their days of, of self-liberation, prohibited foreigners from owning land in Haiti without getting, you know, some kind of special permission or generally, you know, by by marrying into a Haitian family. And that wasn't going to work for the Americans who wanted to just, you know, buy a bunch of stuff in Haiti and make a bunch of money. So the Wilson administration, the State Department decided to write a new constitution. So there was a new pup, there was a, a puppet president in Haiti at that point, but the P Haitian parliament was still essentially independent. And so Butler led an armed column of Marines and uh, members of the Gendarmerie d'Aïti, which was the Haitian client army, basically a, a preview of, uh, you know, the, the Afghan National Army or like our client militaries in Iraq and other places, which people might be more familiar with today. And he said, you're done. And they sh he shut down the parliament, went through the archives, destroyed all the records of the parliament's last votes in which they were planning to, to reject the American written constitution. And the parliament didn't meet again for 12 years. And that was done, you know, on behalf of banks. So it was not a ridiculous thought for a banker to be like, this guy is good at doing these things. The other thing that I'll, that I'll note is, and this is like another, another piece of, of uh, American history, really important American history that most Americans don't know about. And I don't want to go like too into the weeds with this either, but oh, two let's. years. Well, we can go in the weeds. I, you can, I don't, as, as you can probably tell, like, I'm like a going, like, I live in the weeds. Is basically, <laughs> I'm, I'm reporting live from the weeds. So in 1932, so two years before uh, he, he uh, basically gets approached to do this uh, business plot um, and, and blows the whistle, um, there's an event called the Bonus March. Um, so essentially, World War I veterans have been promised uh, back pay for their time in world in in the first world war at that at that point the only world war, you know since that war ended, uh, they they had been told that they wouldn't be paid until either the service member died, uh, or 1945 whichever came first, but it's 1932 the depression is at its bottom, and they need this money now so tens of thousands of veterans and their families converge on Washington to stage a month long kind of protest occupation. It's basically, you know, occupy Washington 1932 um, to demand that Congress and President Herbert Hoover act on 
paying them the money that they need. And most of the establishment derided them as communists and degenerates and like, and and, you know, one of the organizers definitely had fascist sympathies and Butler sided with the veterans because he was a veteran himself. Um, and he had been in World War One at, at the rear, but as a general at a, uh, you know, overseeing a disembarkation and, and reembarkation camp. And he gave this stirring, uh, speech to them, encouraging them to stay. Side note to the side note, nine days after his speech, Herbert Hoover sends the army led by Douglas MacArthur with his adjutants, uh, Major Dwight Eisenhower and Major George Patton to attack the veterans, burn their encampment. They launch tear gas, chemical weapons, uh, a baby dies. Um, and uh, it's, it's, known as, it's known as the Battle of Washington. So if you were paying close attention, and maybe with the, to a certain extent with the benefit of hindsight, although, you know, let it be said, fascists, dangerous as they are, have never been known for their perceptiveness or intelligence generally. <laughs> um, there were these newsreels that showed Butler addressing, you know, tens of thousands of veterans in the shadow of the Capitol. And they're sitting there hanging on his every word. And if you, if it's, you know, it's now 1933, 1934, and you're thinking, who do we pick to lead this, you know, mob uh, that that's going to intimidate the president? I mean, a guy who's done a bunch of coups, a guy who, and a guy who, who they love, who is, who has been seen on camera rallying them. It just so happens that they missed the part where his politics had taken a, a major left turn. I think it's fair to say. And that he was close personal friends with Franklin Roosevelt going back to their shared days in Haiti, which I've, I've now gone on about way too much. So let's. No, this is. This is perfect. signing off from the weeds, Jonathan. <laughs> this is perfect because you're assembling a lot of pieces for the story. They did miscalculate severely, uh, and you could make a strong argument that the United States today is immensely fortunate that they screwed up. Uh, what one thing that I think is um, interesting by way of comparison for people first hearing about this in 2021 is that. When you think of Butler from the perspective of his contemporaries and from this time in his life, think of Captain America. Think of like an older, retired Captain America who still has a lot of vim and vigor and fight in him. This, he's still a hero. Yeah, yeah. He's considered, he is considered, of course, um, an infernal force to the people of Haiti, but to the people back home, he is a war hero. And this is something that they sought, to, no pun intended, the, the banking forces sought to capitalize upon. That's two levels of no pun intended, but here we are. So one, one thing that really stands out to me in these conversations when we've been talking and something you address in Gangsters of Capitalism is the weird opinion of fascism. Right. Nowadays, most people in, in the US can agree, whatever their political <laughs> ideology, that fascism, however nebulously defined, is a bad thing. That is no longer a hot take, right? But but this wasn't always the case. And you know, you can see this in the statements and beliefs of business tycoons of Butler's Day. Could could you tell us a little bit more about what they saw fascism as and why they preferred it to, you know, what they saw as the dangerous, vast red shadow of communism or socialism. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Mussolini in particular was really, really popular um, in, it, you know, throughout the, the 1920s and, and the early 1930s, at least, and certainly up to this point uh, that we're talking about in 1934. Um, not with everybody, but, you know, much more popular than I think that than than people maybe in, in 2022 fully appreciate. He was seen by a lot of people as sort of this, you know, strong modernizer. You know, Mussolini in, in particular had come out of, he, he had come out of the socialist movement in Italy, but rejected it ultimately, and essentially came up with fascism as a way of sort of doing a socialist style 
uh, reorganization of society, by which I mean breaking away from the liberal order um, and and breaking away from sort of, you know, 19th century style capitalism. But he did it by rejecting class analysis or by using a class, I guess, by using a class analysis that basically said that like rich people could keep their money <laughs> and, <laughs> and rich people really like that. Like that, that, that was, that was a really exciting thing for them because again, like, you know, you know, socialism, it was a very attractive idea to a lot of people, still is, because it promises a better way of life for, for more people. Um, and so Mussolini is basically saying, like, we'll do that, but instead of, you know, using sort of uh, class analysis and class politics and labor unions to, to you know, improve people's lives, we'll just, like, have rich people stay rich and then break the heads of <laughs> Of, of, you know, anybody who like we feel like it doesn't actually make any sense. Like it's a complete, <laughs> is it like it's a completely incoherent like way of thinking about the world. But if you are, say, you know, Thomas Lamott, who was the, the, the uh, head of JP Morgan and Company at this moment, he called himself, you know, something of a missionary for Mussolini. He was like, he was friends with him. The Johnson-Reed Act, so the Johnson-Reed Extremely Racist Immigration Act that, that kind of shut off uh, immigration, you know, from, from uh, Europe and, uh, you know, it, this lasted for for decades, basically until until the 1960s. One of the sponsors of that, Reed, you know, said, you know, on the Senate floor that like you know he thought that you know the United States could use a Mussolini. You know, the the American Legion they invited Mussolini to speak. Uh, they you know they would open their conventions with like you know greetings from a fellow uh, you know honorable you know World War veteran. <laughs> <laughs> Senor Mussolini. There's a song from uh, uh, the musical uh, Anything Goes, you know, You're the Top. And one of the versions of that, you know, so it's like, you're the top, you're the Mona Lisa, like, you're like all the best things that are like in the 20s. And one of the lines was like, you're Mussolini, right? <laughs> wow. People like, it was dumb. Like, in re- like, it was really <laughs> stupid. And it became and it became very clear, I think, shortly after this. So one of the things that Mussolini did that 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 discredited him quickly was invading Ethiopia. Uh, it was a horrendous invasion. They used mustard gas and fighter planes and it was sort of a, a preview of, of uh, the Second World War. Um, and then obviously everything that happened after that, the Spanish Civil War, World War II, like, you know, fascism is, is pretty much <laughs> discredited at this point. But it appeals to a certain kind of mind. People who are just sort of like, the best thing to do is to crack the skulls of my enemies. The best thing to do is to have like, you know, one strong leader uh, who, you know, who speaks with authority and tells me what to believe. Um, you know, that's that's appealing to, to some people. And again, in 1934, you know, if you were a very wealthy businessman, um, and you see your, you know, your fellow uh, rich guy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, come into office and say, you know, uh, you know, he takes the dollar off the gold standard. He, you know, declares an immediate bank holiday. He's, he's, you know, trying to to regulate the banks. He's trying to sort of regulate the excesses of capitalism that led to the crash that that you know creates uh, the Great Depression. You know, you're like. Oh God, this sounds so much like socialism because to some extent it was. I mean, it, he was taking some of the good ideas that socialism had and using them really to save capitalism. But, um, you know, you could, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with them, but I'm just sort of trying to put, put, put you and, 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 you know, the people listening in the mindset of like what would make somebody think this. And to a certain extent, we're seeing this again today. I mean, you know, liberal democracy is again, been being discredited in various ways. It doesn't sort of matter where you are on the political spectrum. Like liberal has kind of become a dirty word, um, you know, even if you're on the left. And there is sort of a, you know, as, as Franklin Roosevelt noted in, in his day, you know, kind of a, a hunger uh, among some people for a strong man, and it's almost always a man, 
who, you know, will destroy their your enemies and, you know, tell you who to hate and then give you permission. And this is really the, the big thing. It will give you permission to just like live out your just, you know, most extreme, you know, Freudian <laughs> psychosexual fantasies in in destroying these people. And that just as it did back then, it is now as memory of of the horrors of fascism, uh, you know, in the 1930s and the 1940s, as as everybody who remembers those things is, you know, slowly, you know, going away, rip Betty White um, and her generation. That is, again, starting to appeal to people. And, you know, in, and that's in, in a lot of ways what makes this such an urgent conversation to have. Can we go back to the Spanish-American War for a moment? Because I, I think Smedley Butler had that maybe that moment where all of a sudden there's something worth fighting for when the USS Maine explosion tragedy occurs. And I think it's 260 individuals lost their lives during that. And it was, you know, blamed pretty squarely on the Spanish forces and uh, through, you know, through the things that were written. And is it the New York Journal? I forget. What's the what's the. Uh, that's the one, New York Journal at yeah, the time. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Um, the Herald was the Hearst paper, and the Journal was the Pulitzer paper. I'm, so I'm yeah, so getting those confused. Yeah, but there, there's some. Yes. You know, there are articles written that basically identify an enemy and something worth fighting for, and that's when Smedley, around the time when Smedley joins up, correct? It's exactly what it is. To put it in in modern terms, it was basically a 9/11 of its day. I don't say that lightly, uh, and 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 maybe I should like you know define a couple of terms in there just so people don't get the wrong impression. But what what I, what I mean basically is that it was a big spectacular event that was in, that was immediately interpreted as a national tragedy, as an attack on the nation, um, that 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 called out for revenge, and then was used as one pretext. It wasn't actually the only pretext, but it was it was one, and it was a major pretext for the U.S. invasion of Cuba. So back to the weeds. So Cuba, Cuba's an mm. island in the Caribbean. So Cuba... Um, <laughs> Cuba, Cuba was a, a colony of Spain, and it had been uh, basically since Christopher Columbus dropped anchor in Guantanamo Bay in, in, uh, in, in 1494. And um, Cubans had been fighting for their independence for about 30 years at that point. Um, and they were very close to, to winning it. Um, a, a new war had started in 1895. And to a certain extent, it, it had the best thing you could say to, for, for the Spanish was that they had battled to a, a stalemate at that point. But the Spanish were they they were committing horrible horrible atrocities against the Cuban people. Um, they invented a thing called uh, reconcentración, which is translated by into English as concentration camps. So they invented concentration camps in Yikes. Cuba. Um, and you know they're starving the population. Uh, they're you know killing women and children. It's 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 a it's it's a nightmare. And the Maine, the battleship Maine, one of uh, America's first two steel battleships, goes to Havana Harbor on a mission to basically protect American interests in Cuba during this war. And it explodes, and nobody knows why it explodes. And actually. Contrary to popular belief, the U.S. government never actually makes a statement that the Spanish were responsible for the explosion. They also don't make a statement like disclaiming the rumors that the Spanish were, were responsible for the, the explosion. They kind of use that frenzy, which, as you know, was, you know, really created by, you know, the sort of the Cuban exile war caucus, but also by the newspapers, especially Joseph Pulitzer, who, for whom the Pulitzer Prizes are named, by the way, and, and William Randolph Hearst. And so Smedley Butler is a 16-year-old. He's in high school uh, on on the main line of Philadelphia in a town called Westchester. And he, uh, you know, he hears about this and he's spurred into action, like like a lot, like like a lot of people. And you know, he he sees himself as avenging the deaths of of the sailors and, and the Marines who died on on the main. Um, and he also sees himself as, you know, as he puts it, shouldering a rifle to, to free little Cuba. So he gets into that war for anti-imperialist, you know, democratic. They're, they're, they're filtered through this sort of racist, paternalist, like, idea that, like, a 16-year-old white kid from, like, the suburbs of Philly is needed to, like, 
help the Cubans like fight a war that they've already been fighting for 30 years. Like it doesn't actually make any sense when you think about it, but it made sense to him. And so he actually lies about his age and, and joins the Marines. What I wanted to say about, you know, the comparisons to, to 9-11 um, is that the Maine is often sort of, you know, talked about, especially online as being like a, you know, the, the, the prime example of a false flag attack. And 9-11 is like in the darker corners of the internet, sometimes, you know, sort of talked about in the same way. Um, and uh, I, I, I've seen no evidence that, <laughs> I mean, the Bush administration certainly used 9-11 for their own purposes. Um, and, and it was, it was, it, it ended up being, crassly convenient for them. Um, but I don't see any evidence that like they actually like planned it or did it. And, and by this, by the same token, there's no evidence that the McKinley administration like purposefully blew up their own ship in order to, to justify going to war. They, they probably would have been able to justify going to war anyway. There, there was already sort of a, a beating drums, uh, you know, in that direction in Congress, which at that point had the power to declare war, still does technically, but doesn't really use it. And, you know, it just seems like it was a design flaw, basically like the boiler was next to the munition store and it was just a dumb, it was a dumb design for a ship, essentially. <laughs> yeah, there are definitely events that, you know, help to spur action. We see that in Gulf of Tonkin. We see that in, I mean, Pearl Harbor all the way across across the board. There's always one thing that ends up being the thing that at least is remembered by history as the thing that occurred. Then everything else happened. Exactly. <laughs> and just like and just like Smedley Butler in the main, a lot of people on 9-11, you know, especially young people, especially young men, we're like, my country needs me. I'm going to go fight for democracy. And that's how you end up, you know, getting people to fight in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're going to pause for a word from our sponsors. who are you know, hopefully not Halliburton or something. And we'll be back with more from Jonathan Katz. <laughs> We've returned with more on the complicated legacy of General Smedley Butler. Can we go back to the business plot for just one second? I'm intrigued. We keep, we keep kind of hitting on echoes, you know, in history of, of things that happened then and, thing, and kind of parallels of, of things that we know from more recent history. Um, the idea of a cabal of elite business people um, conspiring to overthrow the government is like such red meat for like conspiracy theorists and just like it's like sort of the quintessential thing everyone's scared about happening but we we've we've sort of talked on the show um a lot about how like you almost don't even have to do that anymore like to go to that extreme to organize in that way because everything's sort of so set up for the success of these elite business people already like the way our, our system has sort of evolved or devolved I guess um, can you speak to that a little bit about what would a modern analog of this even look like or is it something that people would even seek because business people at that level are already so set up and uh, you know government is already already so in their pocket. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the, one of the things, you know, to look at the business plot in its own moment and then look at, there were other analogs in that, in that era that I think, you know, in, in some ways are closer to the things that are actually happening in, in this country now, you know, fascists never really came to power as th th there's, I can't think of an example of fascists coming to power as a result of sort of, as you note, like an elite cabal you know, planning a, a, a secret takeover um, and then overthrowing the government. They tended to come to power through a combination of mass action and, and street violence, but also parliamentary action, right? So, you know, Hitler becomes chancellor, essentially, you know, prime minister of, of the Reichstag um, through democratic means. Um, he, you know, an, an alliance between the Nazis who were the far, far right party, obviously in Germany at that time. And then also the, and then also the, the, the slightly less extreme conservatives, um, who stupidly thought that they could control him and they would just sort of like make him like this figurehead, uh, prime minister. And then, and then everything would turn out okay. Mussolini comes to power in the 1920s. Again, this is sort of a a a, a, a preview of, of the plans, or this was part of where the business plotters, however many there were, we, can, we could talk about that, drew their inspiration. It was from uh, a, an action in 1922 called the March on Rome, uh, where basically, you know, a bunch of just, you know, 
fascisti thugs, um, you know, came to Rome, the capital, and and intimidated the government, um, and then convinced the king of Italy to appoint Mussolini as his prime minister and, and appointed and and, uh, and convinced the parliament to to approve it. The event that actually the business plotters. Uh, were the you know the one business plotter that we know was there right was was this guy Gerald C Maguire he was like a 37 year old bond salesman who's the who's the guy who actually does the 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 attempted recruiting of uh, Smedley Butler and he's and he's the only one who actually gets uh, called before Congress after you know it, it, before the same subcommittee that Butler uh, testified in front of, um, and he purges himself and lies about a whole lot of things. But in so doing, he essentially confirms all the salient points that 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 Butler alleged against him. So we have him, and he says to Butler, uh, according to Butler, um, that his inspiration. McGuire takes this tour of Europe in early 1934, and he goes to all the hotspots. He goes to Italy, he goes to Germany, and he goes to France. And in, it's in France that he finds the, the model that he thinks is most best suited to the American, you know, culture. Um and he he meets a group called the Croix de Feu, the the, the fiery cross, and it's kind of like a you know a, a, like a like a super militaristic version of the American Legion. Although the American Legion obviously was also uh, was also doing sort of you know street actions and 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 you know strike breaking and stuff like that. But this Croix de Feu was was even more violent, and it's made up of French veterans of the last World War. And the reason why the Croix de Feu is important and an important model is that a couple weeks before Maguire's in Paris, on February 6, 1934, another thing that people don't know about, there is a, a enormous anti-parliamentary riot in Paris consisting almost entirely of fascist and far-right groups and one group of revolutionary communists, because like... They didn't want to miss out on it. And they are, they storm parliament. Let, tell me if any of this sounds familiar. It's kind of a, a, a loosely organized group of people that all have, they're all sort of in the same direction, but they kind of all hate each other. And, and a bunch of them are just like a bunch of clowns. And they are like, they end up storming the legislature. Um, and just end up fighting the police. Most of the people who die are the rioters themselves. About 15 of them, I think, are killed. But they terrify the French people uh, because, you know, their demand and, – and oh, by the way, they're also uh, animated by a conspiracy theory. Um, there was a, a uh, an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory because a prominent corrupt uh, individual – uh, named Jeffrey Epstein, I'm sorry, uh, named Stavitsky, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, has just gotten rung up for corruption. And so they then build out this like huge, just ridiculous conspiracy theory that basically like everyone in the French government on the left or basically left of left of the fascists are cannibal it, pedophiles. Yeah. yeah they, it's like they're, they're corrupt and they're like, they're selling out the French people. And, and, and it's basically on the basis of this, that they, they storm uh parliament and just as on January 6th. Um, and by the way, it's even known by its date. It's called the cease février in, in French. So it's just, it's just known as February 6th still is. So on fe- just on, it's on January 6th on February, February 6th, they don't achieve their their main aim, um, but they do succeed in, because it's a parliamentary system, getting the, oh, and they're also trying to, basically, they're trying to keep a, a, a government that's been elected from being seated. That's the, that's the last, that's the last obvious parallel, right? And, but they do succeed in, in having sort of the, the, the center left prime minister of France, who they say is, you know, a communist, but he isn't. He's just like a, he's just a, a normal liberal. He's just not a fascist. He's just not a fascist. He, he resigns um, in, in favor of, of a conservative. And, and this ends up having long implications in, in French history. Uh, it's, it's kind of the creation of what's known as the Popular Front, which was sort of a, 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 a coalition between socialists and liberals to, to fight against fascism. But then it also helps coalesce what ends up becoming the Vichy collaboration you know, government in France that takes power when when the Nazis invade. 
the point of all of these, all of this rambling is that what all of these things have in common and what they have, what is different between them and the business plot is that they are all examples of mass action that actually involves like a significant portion of a society. There, there needed, there needed to be a large number of people who believed in this shit and were willing to go into the streets and get into fights and draw blood. And, and then the, a larger number of people around them that was willing to, you know, cheer and, you know, write songs about them and all these other things. You, you need, you need all of that really to see a fascist coup or a fascist government succeed. And, you know, there are a number of reasons why um, it's it, the business plot, uh, such as it was, didn't succeed in in overthrowing the government. I, I mean, I think the biggest one is that Smedley Butler blew the whistle on it before it could go any further, assuming it would have gone any further. But one of the things that I think that that did, maybe, was uh, to discredit whatever was trying to happen, you know, behind the scenes before, you know, what would be known now like as an AstroTurf campaign, before, before sort of this messaging could get out and, and create this kind of mass action. But also like the people who Butler alleges were behind it were people like, you know, the DuPonts and like, you know, the head of General Motors. These were people who were maybe also sort of, and JP Morgan, you know, and company. These were people who were also maybe so sort of out of touch with the would-be rank and file, you know, the, the working class, the, the people in the country who they would need to, to get behind them, um, that maybe they would have had a hard time doing it anyway. However, however again, we'll talk about this, but however far the planning had gotten. That's the, that's the question. So that's one of the spooky things that we keep going back and forth over. You know, we know that the person who contacted Butler originally, we know uh, that they they were definitely attempting to proselytize. They were definitely like evangelizing, pitching him on how great this would be. But I love that you point out there are serious questions about how successful uh, a coup d'etat would have actually been when the... Um, rubber of fascism hits the road, as it were. But one thing, this is one thing that I think is haunting about this situation. Uh, and I, I would love to hear you speak on this in a little more detail. My general understanding of what happens, Butler says, ah, 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 we have differing views on what constitutes patriotism. So he blows the whistle. Congress hears him out. He does testify to, to Congress. And Congress does listen to him at least, but then there's a moment where Congress just sort of doesn't do shit, right? If I, if I could use the technical legislative term here, they just don't. Uh, so that missing part, right? The, the fact that they did not move forward on there is why um, folks like you and us have to carefully deploy the word allegedly in a lot of these conversations. So I I would love to hear your, um, cause you are the foremost expert on this now. So I would love to hear your concepts or your, your perspective on why those investigations never occurred. Like why was there never, why, why was there never like a hard hitting dive into DuPont? You know, uh, why, why was that? So the committee that Butler testifies in front of is a subcommittee, but it's 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 the the leaders of this larger committee. It's called the Select uh, Committee on Un-American Activities, and my fellow history nerds out there might those words might ring a bell. This is what becomes ultimately HUAC which is one of the most notorious committees in, in American history. It is uh, associated with the McCarthy era. Um, obviously, Joseph McCarthy was a senator, so he wasn't on HUAC, but but they were engaging in, in that same kind of sort of red baiting, you know, wish hunting uh, of, of, you know, suspected communists after the Second World War um, during during the Cold War and, and, the, and the Second Red Scare. So that committee was primarily engaged in they, they had been convened to investigate, uh, it was called like Nazi propaganda and other activities. Um, they were interested in, 
attempts by the actual Nazis, right, the, the German National Socialist Workers Party, to infiltrate the United States, which was happening. I mean, there were there were American groups. Um, the Silver Shirts were one. The German American Bund was another um, that that you know was taking direct money and direct funding from the Nazis. And there were Americans who were working with the Nazis, right? So Henry Ford is is one of the most famous. He ends up you know accepting like the Grand Cross of the German Eagle in 1938, which is like there's no good time to be hanging out with Nazis, but like that's <laughs> late. <laughs> that is extremely late, Mr. Ford. Another name, by the way, that that um, often is is it comes up popularly with the business plot, um, but as far as I can tell, was not actually involved. This is sort of a, 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 the result of of miscommunication. Is Prescott Bush, right? Who was the grandfather of uh, George W. Bush and the father of George H. W. Bush? So two presidents. He becomes a senator himself later. The reason why that confusion occurs is because. The same committee that Bo- that uh, that Butler testified in front of was investigating in a separate investigation the bank that Bush was a partner of, Brown Brothers Harriman, because Brown Brothers Harriman was doing business with the Nazis, and they had this sort of joint ownership thing over over a shipping line. So so it's actually not true, but it's like. Bush was too close to the actual Nazis to actually be involved with the business plot um, because the business plot was an entirely homegrown affair. So to a certain extent, maybe that's part of the explanation of of why. Can I kind of jump in really fast, John? Uh, I just want to apologize to everyone listening. I have asserted a couple of times that Prescott Bush was a part of it. I just misunderstood. So I I do apologize there. Um, Wow. He he was too busy in Nicaragua, I guess, with the brown. <laughs> exactly, brown. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it, it's a, it's an easy it's an easy mistake to make. Um, and if anybody out there has you know information that is different than this, like I would love to 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 hear it. Um, I'm always open to to corrections and and trying to be as complete as possible. Um, but but so far as I can tell, that came into the conversation. There was a BBC documentary in 2007 that sort of ran through that very quickly, and and and. And there was like a, a blog post that got written that, that made that confusion. And that's, that's what, you know, and it was, you know, Bush was president at the time. So it, it kind of caught fire and, and here we are. Okay. So that's part of it. The other thing is that, you know, this committee, it had, it had a, a limited shelf life. It was supposed to disband a couple of weeks after Butler testified and it did on schedule. Now it seems like to me, who am I? <laughs> A million years later, you know, it would have been like I, I could have you could have easily made the case to like go back to to, you know, the Speaker of the House and say, like, uh, we have this actual like important thing going on. You know, maybe we should extend the life of this committee for for a little while. Um, they did not. So so there, there are two main members of the committee, John McCormack, who ends up becoming Speaker of the House. Uh, years later, he ends up serving until the 1970s. And Samuel Dickstein, uh, who's a Democrat of New York, they're the two people who really wanted to form this committee, and they're the two people who who hear Butler's testimony under oath um, in special session in New York. And Butler spends a significant portion of 1935 fighting on the radio. Basically, he's like in a poster like flame war with Samuel Dickstein. Where, where Butler has this like radio show, um, uh, sp- sponsored by Pep Boys, by the way, because he's in Philly, um, where he like he's like using his his like Pep Boys radio hour to be like these these assholes aren't like I gave them this thing and they're not investigating it. They they brought the lowest level people forward. Why aren't they going to bring the higher higher level people? And well, he was the, sort of mocked a little bit, wasn't he? Like even publicly, yes. uh, he, he was ashamed to, to some degree. Yes. So, so that, so that's another part of it, right? The initial, the initial reaction by the press to Butler's uh, uh, testimony is ridicule. The New York Times runs the story of him testifying on the front page, but they give most of the real estate to the denials of the people who who Butler implicated. Um, he's mocked in Time magazine. He's mocked in a, in a Times editorial. Later on, there are like very small walkbacks, corrections, um, when 
McCormick and Dickstein, you know, when their committee like issues its final report in 1935, and they're basically like, we were able to verify, you know, the pertinent parts of Butler's testimony as far as they went. Um, we, you know, these, these things, I forget the exact wording, it's in gangsters, but like, it's like, you know, these things were definitely discussed and they may have been put into action, you know, when, when the backers saw fit, but they did not bring the big guys in. And I think it was probably fear of, I mean, these are very powerful people, the DuPonts, um, JP Morgan, uh, you know, his bank, Alfred P. Sloan of General Motors, McCann Erickson ad agency. Um, you know, these were very, very powerful, very influential people. So Butler testifies that Jerry Maguire approached him. Jerry Maguire is brought in to testify, as I said, through a perjury filled, ridiculous testimony. He ends up sort of accidentally confirming most of, of, of what Butler said. Um, they're one of the low level people who sort of seem to be backing Maguire early on uh, is a guy named um, he's, he's the heir to the uh, singer sewing machine fortune. And um, uh, his lawyer comes in and basically throws Maguire under the bus. And it's just sort of like, no, it was all him. It was all him. So one of the reasons why I, why I think maybe more than some other people do that it is credible that Maguire actually had some people behind him is Maguire's boss, a guy named Grayson Mallet Provost Murphy. He was a rich financier who had the resume of someone who would have known how to plan a coup. So he's Butler's age. He joins the military during the Spanish-American War, but goes into military intelligence and spends a couple of decades going around the world to a lot of the places that Butler went, but as a spy. And he works in the Philippines. He seems to be part of the plot to sever Panama from Colombia, uh, which the Marines participate in, which which is what enables the United States to build the Panama Canal and establish the, the U.S. Pan, uh, uh, canal zone. Um, he then goes into private finance. His uncle is uh, the guy who actually calls Brown Brothers, speaking of Prescott Bush, and tells them, you should come in, into Nicaragua um, and, and take over the banks and, and we can get the, the Marines behind you. Um, he tours Europe after World War I. He's in, in, he's in Europe uh, helping run the American Red Cross um, during the First World War. And then he tours Europe after the war with Wild Bill Donovan, who ends up becoming the spy master head of what's known as the OSS, which is, you know, the, the immediate forerunner to the CIA. So this is a guy who would have known Butler very well, not necessarily personally, but he would have known his career. And he certainly, you know, as I say in Gangsters, would have known his way around the planning of a coup. That is Jerry Maguire's boss. And with that, we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more from Jonathan Katz. And we're back with more from Jonathan Katz. I just want to pause for a moment and point this out, although it's extraordinarily petty. When we hear these kind of stories, Jonathan, with all with this massive connections and evidence and people getting away, I am yet again flabbergasted. Like, I can't even get out of a late fee at the library. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Where's the justice? <laughs> Uh, but yes. you're, but you're laying out this case like it's. it's Although libraries that are I, extremely important, I just want to yes, know. libraries are, and mm -hmm. I do pay the fees. Yes. <laughs> in done. case yeah. they're listening, yeah. I do pay the fees, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but the um, the the thing that we're talking about here that I think should disturb a lot of people is the the hidden connections here. You know, the there is you don't even need necessarily active obfuscation or a conspiracy by design, because if people have these close relationships, they as rational actors are going to move toward uh, things that they feel are acts of self-preservation, right? And, and we also, just to highlight, I'm sure a lot of us listening at home were thinking this too, we also have to highlight these tremendously powerful people don't just have the ability to influence their friends in government. They have the ability to influence their friends in media. So I personally feel that it is highly unlikely that editorial boards at Time and the New York Times 
just independently decided to report a similar slant. But, thinking you know, the same thing. And I left out, by the way, of, of Murphy's some when Murphy goes into private finance, he ends up being part of the JP Morgan universe. Um, he ends up overseeing the controlling loan uh, that, that, that the Morgans end up controlling uh, in the Dominican Republic, where, where, where Butler and the Marines also invade. And so he he's very closely tied to JP Morgan. And, you know, Gerald Maguire, when he's in France meeting with the Croix de Feu, uh, you know, this, this, this fascist group or far right group, I guess, um, his, his headquarters in Paris is, uh, more, is, is essentially the Morgan subsidiary in Paris. Um, that, so all of that said, in order to get from these guys to the bigger names, the DuPonts, Alfred P. Sloan, you know, et cetera. McGuire says to Butler, and Butler testifies, that there is going to be a group that emerges that is going to be, he calls them the villagers in the opera, right? So the, 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 the extras, right, in the background who are going to be supporting this thing. And uh, he, he predicts that um, there, this new organization is going to emerge, and he's like, you're going to see it in the front pages, you know, in the next couple of weeks. And as Butler says, lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, on the front page of the New York Times, this new organization emerges and announces itself called the Liberty League. It is a group that is founded by the DuPonts with all these other guys that I that I mentioned. It also has two uh, former Democratic candidates for president, uh, Al Smith and John W. Davis. Um, who remain important Democrats, you know, throughout the the uh, middle part of the 20th century, you know, they're Democrats, but they're but they become anti FDR, anti New Deal Democrats, and um, you know, because they're sort of hearkening back to the older conservative tradition in the Democratic Party, and um, you know, the Liberty League is indisputably an anti FDR, anti New Deal group. It is. It's basically a a, a business led interest group that is trying to short circuit and stop the New Deal and stop the redistribution of wealth from the people who caused the Great Depression to the to the masses who are the victims of the Great Depression. Right. That's that's what the Liberty League wants, which is also what the business plotters wanted. So it's not. It, it is. It is. In no way is it beyond the realm of imagination that they could have backed the sort of thing because they wanted this thing. And by the way, Grayson M.P. Murphy is the treasurer of the Liberty League. Okay, so this is all very, very strong circumstantial evidence. It is not definitive evidence. Definitive evidence would have needed a paper trail. It would have needed Congress calling in the big shots the DuPonts, Al Smith, John W. Davis, you know, uh, Alfred P. Sloan, Pew, all every all it seems like all these guys who have like big like charitable trusts these days, they were all part of like the Liberty League, right? Um, and it it, it would have needed you know uh, more definitive investigation, more definitive reporting, and that was not done. It was not done at the time. Butler enlists a reporter who he knew from his days. Uh, running the Philadelphia Police Department. By the way, Butler spent a couple of years uh, running and militarizing the Philadelphia Police Department. Um, just that, safety that's in the director. Book. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's in the book you read it. Um, but um, uh, yeah, he brings that one guy in basically to do sort of his own allied, you know, maybe quote unquote independent investigation because he's he's definitely you know siding with Butler in this. Um, but there's no there's no other investigative journalism done, and there's no congressional investigation. And that's, and, and that's the part that's missing. You know, I, I say in the book, like, you know, it is possible that the interpretive denials that are issued by, you know, these principles, um, that they were legitimate. Like, it may be that they hadn't heard about this happening yet because Grace and Murphy hadn't come to them yet, you know, maybe or, Maybe, or maybe, or maybe he, maybe, you know, maybe he had just started talking about it, but they hadn't agreed to anything yet. Or maybe they hadn't. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe these plans 
Maybe these plans were in the works and, and Butler blew the whistle on him. And who knows? It's really hard to say. And that's one of the things that's lost by the, by, by the lack of investigation. And so, you know, the answer is, and this is something that, that I, I'm afraid that we're going to see with the, with, you know, the January 6th, uh, committee. Um, you know, they seem to be going farther and they're, they're, they're doing a longer investigation, uh, than, than the, the un-American, uh, activities committee did you know, with, with Butler's allegations, um, in 1934. But one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of is that there will be, and we see this right now with, with Biden's, uh, Justice Department, with Merrick Garland. There is a, there is an American allergy among elites <laughs> and um, among power elites and economic elites to, uh, you know, uh, uh, holding their own accountable. Unless it is absolutely necessary, like unless unless they unless they have absolutely no choice, um, and and that's that's that, and that was what Butler was yelling at at, at Samuel Dickstein about, and and it may be what we uh, it may, it could be what we see happen now, and I think it would be more dangerous for that to happen now even than than then. Yes, and that's what's another thing that's important about that point. I would argue is that there is um, a misconception in the American public that. Self-preservation of an elite class is often apolitical, right? It's it's not something that is more common to one party than another. Um, and with this, you know, um, our our show today is running a a, a little longer, uh, but but we're just scratching the surface. We're obviously fans of your work here, and it touch, there, there are so many things we have not touched on now. Uh, one of the last questions that we had was about what this tale can teach us about the present day. And I love that you're, you've already taken us to that point. To put a really fine point on this, to, to throw a bow on it, what would you say people who check out Gangsters of Capitalism or people who familiarize themselves with Butler's story – what what should they take away from it? The shortest way to put it is, you know, that that it can happen here, right? Um, in fact, the book "It Can't Happen Here" by Sinclair Lewis was was in a lot of ways inspired by uh, you know Butler's whistleblowing on on the business plot. Like he 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 drew he drew inspiration from that event, and he 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 had ha- had run-ins with with Butler uh, before that, which which I talk about in Gangsters. Uh, Sinclair Lewis had. Um, I think that it is, it is, first of all, that we need to know our history, not just the business plot. I mean, you know, gangsters is, is really the business plot, uh, and, and Butler's, you know, end of life activism kind of bookended. But the meat of the book, really almost the entire book is about, uh, Butler and the Marines, you know, conquests and invasions of Nicaragua, China, uh, uh, the Philippines, Haiti, et cetera, et cetera, Mexico, all of these things that happened uh, much more recently than wars that we, we spend much more time talking about, like the Civil War, but that Americans don't know anything about. And the rest of the world does know about these, especially the places that we invaded. And it puts us at a disadvantage when we're, under, when we're, when we're trying to, to you know, uh, deal with with those countries in, in terms of international relations, but also comes with a disadvantage in, in terms of understanding ourselves. Um, you know, there were a lot of thinkers, especially, you know, people who had, had gone through the process of colonization themselves, uh, in, in the decades after this period, you know, in, in, in the mid 20th century, um, Ame Césaire, uh, the, the, the great, uh, uh, French, uh, uh, writer from, from, um, uh, Martinique, uh, and, uh, Franz Fanon, uh, they both talked about, Franz Fanon had this great, uh, description of fascism, that fascism is colonialism practiced in the heart of a traditionally colonialist country. Ooh, and what, I like that. It's very good. <laughs> yeah. Very good, Franz Fanon. Um, uh, and he, and, and what he is arguing there is it was, you know, it was, it was primarily, you know, they, they were, they were, uh, gearing that toward Europe, but it's also applicable to the United States. And in order to understand the ways in which it is applicable to the United States requires understanding that we have been a traditionally colonialist country. We've been many things. We are many things. We've also, we are also a, a great 
you know, innovator of democracy and, and the country, you know, that was founded on the, pr- the principle that, that uh, all men are created equal, even if it wasn't true at all then, as far as the founders were concerned. And, and, and we have struggled to make it true since, but that's part of us too. But we have also done these horrible things and, and continuing to do them up to the present day with, with, you know, the, the drone war and, and, you know, our, our conquests of, of countries in the Middle East. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, what was happening in 1934 was that these forces, which had been unleashed abroad by people, including maybe especially Smedley Butler, were then trying to be applied at home. And the idea was that if you could do this to your enemies abroad, if you can do this to people that you consider subhuman abroad, why not just declare your political enemies subhuman and do it to them? And we are we we are seeing that tendency take root again in the United States in 2022. You know, you see it in poll after poll as Americans say, you know, that they are more willing to see uh, uh, political violence applied to, you know, the other side, especially those numbers go up, especially high. I think it was like 40% of people were saying, you know, before the 2020 election, that as long as they could sort of justify to them, as long as the other party did it first, well, what that really means, as long as you can ju- justify yourself saying that the other party is is doing it first. You know, if you consider like the COVID vaccine to be violence, then like, then all is permitted, right? As, 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 you know, and that, that's, that's a fascist tendency. Um, and, and, you know, and you, and we saw in the run up to that election, um, people saying that, you know, they would be willing to do anything to keep the other side from gaining power in the same way that Americans were willing to, you know, do anything after 9-11. We were willing to torture, we were willing to invade, we were willing to kill. And it's, it's, the, the important thing is understanding those connections existed in the 1930s, those, those connections exist today. And it is only by talking about them and understanding structurally what is happening that we can understand how seriously to take this threat of losing our democracy, of, of, of losing these extremely fragile, oftentimes not fully lived out principles. I need to jump in really quickly. I mean, like, not only not fully lived out, but not even <laughs> – enforceable in some ways mm-hmm. like it's sort of like a lot of it is like a, a matter of decorum yes. whether leaders choose to follow those norms you know it's almost like uh, uh polite exactly. <laughs> but, but now people are not being polite anymore you know what i mean yeah i mean like you know one of the people who i mean god knows i don't know how to get through to christian christian cinema if i did i'd i'd i would but like you know, she she's somebody who, you know, she was a progressive and she's somebody who, you know, could benefit from from understanding, you know, how, you know, the, the United States is a country that has not been above using violence and dehumanization uh, all over the world. And it took somebody like Smedley Butler, who had done those things and then regretted them, right? I mean, he, you know, at the same time that he that he blows the whistle on the business plot, a year later, um, he he writes, you know, a series of, of articles for, uh, uh, frankly, a socialist magazine called Common Sense, in which he says, you know, I, you know, participated in the raping of half a dozen Central American com- countries. I made, you know, uh, Mexico and China safe for, for, for the oil companies. I was a racketeer for capitalism. Um, and, and to a certain extent, what he's doing over the last 10 years of his life is, is trying to, to make that right. And and we are at we are at a moment when, you know, uh, you know, the, the Voting Rights Act has been gutted and, you know, Congress is is uh, the Democrats in Congress are trying to, uh, you know, pass a, a, a voting rights bill. And they're being stymied by, you know, two Democrats in, in Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema who are saying like, oh, but it's this holy principle of like the filibuster, which is, to, which is really a brand right. new thing that didn't exist. Anyway, that's going off topic. But what, <laughs> but, but, what, but, what I'm, but what I'm trying to say is like, they need to understand how urgent this is and they need to understand how easily it could happen. And, you know, the one thing to, 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 to take, I, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, the media in 1934 was certainly influenced by their contacts and their sympathies in the business community. But to a certain extent also, 
they didn't understand how real the threat was because they didn't fully understand what had been happening for all those decades overseas. Smedley Butler did. He had, you know, he had overthrown the parliament in Haiti. He had overthrown governments all over the world. He knew how easily, how, how it doesn't actually take, you know, a great cinematic event to, to overthrow a democracy, that all you need are a critical mass of people you know, the wrong people in the right place at the right time to do it because he had been one of those wrong people and he was now trying to be one of the right people and we need more people to stand up and and be the right people today to keep that from happening. That is so well said. So peek behind the curtain, folks. We actually, we paused for a second because there's so much stuff that we didn't get to. And uh, Matt, Noel and I actually had a little bit of a back and forth over what we what we could get to. We are, believe it or not, just scratching the surface of an incredibly, incredibly dense story. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the show. But I think more importantly, thank you for writing this book, because this is this is both something people need to know. And I would argue it's uh, stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, or certainly people at the time did not. Could you let our audience know uh, where to find you, where to contact you? Earlier, you had said, you know, if anyone has some Prescott Bush evidence, hit me up. So where can people do that? Yeah. So first of all, uh, Gangsters of Capitalism is out. You can buy it anywhere that you buy books. Uh, independent bookstores are great. Please support them. But, you know, you can any, anywhere, anywhere, anywhere that you get your books, you, you can get it. Um, you can find me. I have a newsletter. Uh, it is called The Racket, uh, named for Smedley Butler's uh, book, War is a Racket. Uh, you can find that at theracket.news. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Cats on Earth. Earth, at K-A-T-Z, on this planet that we're on. Well, we did it. We, uh, we sort of tricked you, dear listener, uh, and ourselves into attending a college class. Amazing. <laughs> this episode brought to you by thegreatcourses.com, but no. not really, but that was just as good, if not better, than any of their offerings. Yeah, there's no tricking here. Uh, like, I would, I would pay for that. Yeah. And we, uh, behind the scenes, we did go back and forth about whether to make this interview segment a two-parter, but we wanted to keep all of this together because the context sort of dovetails so beautifully throughout the, throughout the story. Uh, and we can't wait to hear what you think. We have read this book, uh, Gangsters of Capitalism is out now. Uh, we also have more work with Jonathan Katz coming in the future. Uh, we would love to hear your opinion on what the business plot can teach us today. Uh, what does it tell us about the modern world? Uh, not just the U.S., but the modern concept of democracy in general. I don't know. Is that a good way to set it up, guys? I think it tells us heaps. No, it does. Not all. Not all the best stuff. Really, I mean... From yes, from this conversation, I want us to cover the Spanish American War more. I learned so much from this book and from Smedley Butler's like travels. I learned a lot about what the U.S. was doing and like the the hard choices that were made during that conflict. So I don't know. I'm really into it. Also, I can't get over what a miscue it was on the part of those business elite to try to rope Smedley Butler in to their business plot, like. Better luck next time, guys. Try to read the room better. Um, also, if you're interested in some further listening on sort of a, an adjacent subject, Ben, you and I did an episode about Nazi summer camps in the United States that kind of is adjacent to this story and folds in uh, a lot of the um, reasons that the House on American Committee was created and some of the kind of tensions that were simmering here in the United States. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good call as well. Uh, Matt, I would go one further and say that we have future episodes about whoosh, whoosh, forgotten wars. Mm. You know, um, as as Jonathan pointed out, a lot of people aren't familiar with U.S. activity in Haiti, especially during that time, uh, as well as the Philippines and Panama and all I mean, all these other places that we touched on. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, so we are going to talk a little bit more about that in the future. You can check out our earlier work we have done. But before you do any of that, we want to make sure that you know how to contact us. You know how to make your voice heard as long as the fragile democracy of this podcast stands. 
<laughs> it must stand, and this aggression will not stand. Um, but you can find us, in fact, all over the internet, the usual places of note, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, where we exist under the handle at Conspiracy Stuff. If you're more of an Instagram person, you can find us under the handle at Conspiracy Stuff Show. Big things popping over on the Instagram front uh, in the very near future. So uh, keep an eye out. I, I have a feeling before very much longer you're going to see more than just a sea of new show uh, graphics and, uh, and some more fun stuff coming. It's no spoilers. Reminder of our Facebook group. Here's where it gets crazy. If you do want to join, all you have to do is write one of our names, a couple of our names, just the people who host the show or make this show, including Paul Mission Control Deccan. Uh, and if you don't want to use social media at all, you can instead call us. That's correct. If the spirit so moves you, uh, you need to contact us, but you do not sip the social meads. Just give us a call. Say it with me. one eight three three stdwytk You will have three minutes. Those three minutes are yours and yours alone. Give yourself a fantastic nickname, a code name, an alias, a moniker, an AKA. Tell us what's on your mind. Tell us if we can use your name and or voice on air. And most importantly, do not censor yourself. If you have something that we and your fellow conspiracy realists need to know, and it's going to take more than three minutes to explain, you can skip the phone call entirely and just send us an email. Write the whole thing out. We read every email we get at our uh, good old fashioned address where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.